Is this a pandemic of the unvaccinated? I see that the president continues to double down on this messaging, that this is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, and that's the key problem, those 30-some million Americans who have not received even one dose of the vaccine. I believe this is a problematic way to frame where we are right now in this pandemic, and let me walk you through my thinking on that. First, let's just talk about the age-old principle of medical ethics, which is that even if you think something contributed to someone's healthcare condition, that's not a reason to blame them, shame them, deprive them of medical care in any way, shape, or form. If somebody had been a smoker for many years and has a tobacco-associated cancer, that's no reason to take that or hold it against them. If somebody has eaten unhealthy food for many years, has a heart attack, we don't hold that against that person. And yet now we actually do see including a Washington Post editorial, claiming that if somebody's unvaccinated, that perhaps they shouldn't get unemployment benefits if they're fired for being unvaccinated. That's a very dangerous game to play, trying to take things people did and hold it against them for social services. So I disagree with that. And I think this kind of feeds into that narrative. But let's put this aside. Let's talk about this pandemic. Is it really in this moment a pandemic of the unvaccinated? Well, there's a couple categories of things. One, there's transmission, which is how much of this virus is circulating among people, who's getting it. Then there's symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. Who's feeling sick? Who's got a runny nose? Who's got a sore throat? Who's sick at home coughing? Then there's being hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2 and having severe disease. And then there's even passing away from it. So we know very clearly that there are things that you can do to lower your risk of severe outcomes for SARS-CoV-2. Um, you can't control your age. Unfortunately, that's a huge risk factor. It's on a log gradient. You can improve your health. You can sleep better, lose weight, optimize your medical conditions, and you can get vaccinated, which is a huge risk reduction for hospitalization and death. We have a number of observational studies that show something like 10 times, 13 times the risk reduction in being hospitalized or dying if you were to be vaccinated versus unvaccinated. I do believe there's some confounding there, but I don't believe a confounding variable is so big it can have a tenfold difference in risk. So I think a lot of that is vaccination. It is the causal effect of vaccination vaccination. So vaccination does reduce severe illness and death. And I think that is pretty clear from that observational data, particularly for older people, particularly for older adults, where that signal is rather dramatic in observational data sets. Now, what about symptomatic disease? Well, now that we have Omicron, we have data from Ontario province showing that two doses of vaccine has a vaccine effectiveness of close to 0%. The third dose is 37%, which is rather meager. So when it comes to symptomatic infections, and you start hearing the reports of people who say, I've been double vax, triple vax, but I got sick with COVID. Well, that would happen with vaccine effectiveness in that ballpark. And so is being sick at home with COVID a pandemic of the unvaccinated? I think that's not really true in this moment. I mean, yes, probably. And in fact, you've just heard the numbers. Numerically, there's a slightly higher chance that that would happen to you if you're unvaccinated and have never had COVID than if you were vaccinated and never had COVID. The probability you'll develop Omicron, that's a 37% in that vaccine effectiveness study. But that's not a huge difference. It's not the tenfold difference that we see with hospitalizations and deaths. Finally, there's transmission, asymptomatic transmission. We just have no idea because the studies are really rather um, limited in many ways. They're not uh, robust, and I'll set that aside for a moment. So when somebody says it's a pandemic of the unvaccinated, that doesn't speak to people's experience, people who are at home and having symptoms. I think that that's going to happen a lot to unvaccinated people who don't have natural immunity, and it's going to happen substantively to people who are vaccinated, and we're seeing that all over the board with breakthrough infections. Hospitalization and death, that was what we always cared about. If this was a coronavirus that just had that other stuff, just had symptomatic disease and asymptomatic transmission, we wouldn't have even had an aim for it. We would have gone on with our lives. It's the fact that a small subset of people have hospitalization and death that makes this really severe. And is that a pandemic of the unvaccinated? I will concede that in this moment, that is a huge risk factor for um, people being hospitalized and dying is the status of being unvaccinated. But it's not always going to be this way. And by adding this label right now, you put yourself in a bad situation. Let me walk you through that. As unvaccinated people more and more meet Omicron, which they will because it's spreading like wildfire, those people are going to develop natural immunity. At least the survivors will. And they may not be likely to get sick and hospitalized next year if they've cleared Omicron this year from a SARS-CoV-2 variant because they will have had some natural immunity to this sequence of virus, more or less, more or less. Um, in next year you will possibly see that many people being hospitalized are people who have been vaccinated, but who happen to be older, who have medical comorbidities, who have underlying immunosuppression. 
So if you're going to call this the pandemic of the unvaccinated now, if six months down the road, and I'm not saying I know this to be true, I'm just saying it's possible that it is true. If six months down the road, eight months down the road, it is a pandemic of older, frailer, vulnerable people, are you going to start calling it a pandemic of the old, frail, and vulnerable? That seems rather heartless and it and, and rather unhelpful. And so I think that this whole strategy that the administration pursuing I'm baffled by it because what you want to do is globally, you want to look across the people who are most vulnerable. You want to take the 80-year-olds globally, make sure they're all got one dose in their arm. And then let's go to the 70-year-olds, make sure they got one dose in their arm. And then let's go back to the 80-year-olds, make sure they got the second dose in their arm once we go all the way down the years. And then the last thing you want to focus on, I forgot to mute my phone. And the last thing you want to focus on, the last thing you want to focus on is very young people. You don't want to throw all your political energy in making triple vaccinated college kids sit at home all the time or sit in their dorm rooms. You don't want to put all your efforts into putting through EUAs for boosting very young people without any efficacy data, for instance. Those aren't the places you want to focus your energy on. You want to focus on older, vulnerable, frailer people and making sure they get the first dose in their arm. And so if you think about it as the issue is, the average person out there is unvaccinated. That's the problem. That's probably a misguided way. It's the vulnerable people who, even when they get vaccinated, they're maybe very vulnerable next year or next in the fall. Um, they're the people you want to focus on. And, and, and that's not to be pejorative. It's not, it's nobody's fault that they got COVID-19. You know, I think that we've entered this false idea that people are somehow at fault. Um, it's not a fault uh, that you uh, got a respiratory virus that is a product of living as a primate. I mean, that's why respiratory viruses exist, because we are primates who need social interaction. We interact with people. And of course, it would be natural that a virus will eventually come along and take advantage of the fact that we have to be close to each other. That's part of what it means to be a human being. And that's how they have evolved. And that's why there's so many of them. And then to ask people to be puritanical and wear N95s and respirators and not see anybody for years on end, that's not being human. And of course, people won't be able to sustain that. That's not a failure of the person. That's life. That's being a person. So I think that the more we demonize and, and, and use this kind of rhetoric, we put ourselves in a bad situation. And, you know, it may be true in some places in the moment that the vast majority of hospitalized people are unvaccinated. That might not be true three months from now, six months from now, 12 months from now. And you don't want to paint yourself in the corner of calling it that. And what will you say down the road? And, and again, that may not be true also for symptomatic disease, which is, you know, still, I think, slightly more affecting unvaccinated people. I think that's clear from vaccine effectiveness data, um, but also actually affecting people who've had multiple doses of vaccine and boosting those people with a third dose that has a vaccine effectiveness in the Ontario province state of 37% that may even be short-lived. I'm not sure how much mileage you're going to get out of that strategy. So I would kind of encourage the administration to have a broad arc, think about this a little bit longer, um, to um, avoid the pitfall, which is that if you can portray the culprit here to be the tribe of people that includes your political enemies, that's sort of a smart political move. I don't think it's wise health policy. It's going to lead to more distrust and more problems with public health down the road. So those are my thoughts on this issue. You know what to do. Like this video, like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Until next time.